everybody! Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Cora. Welcome to my library. Today we are doing our third discussion for The Alphstones of Shannara by Terry Brooks. Last time we left off with Eritrea talking to Will and telling him that she likes him and that she wants to help him, you know, if he helps her. So that little bit of information kind of makes me think she doesn't like him yet. She hasn't actually developed real feelings for Will. She's just kind of attracted to him and also kind of sees him as something she can use, she can manipulate in order to get what she wants. I think she wants to use him to get away from Cephalo because she wants to be free. You know, this man who claims to be her father has raised her her entire life. She knows he's not her dad. She doesn't like him. You know, she wants to be free. So she's manipulating Will to helping her get away from her rover family. Shortly after that, they're all kind of just settling down for the night when a demon shows up. It's this big, ugly looking thing, and everyone's freaking out because it's like killing rovers and stuff, and we see a different side of Cephalo. Last time I said that I don't think Cephalo was actually caring about his family. I said that I thought he was just trying to use them to get what he wants, like Eritrea is using Will, but he was fighting for them. He was fighting the demon and helping his men, you know, try to kill it. So maybe he does care about them at least a little bit. Amberly tries to fight it, Eritrea tries to fight it, Will tries to fight it, and this is the big moment when the potential of the Yellowstones is actually revealed. We've heard about, you know, these great magic objects that can be used to kill demons, but We've never actually seen what they can do. Will takes them out of his tunic and he kind of, you know, goes like this, you know, pointing up to the sky with them in his fist, but at first they don't work. And the way that the narrator describes this is that Will felt like there was some kind of blockage inside him that was keeping him from being able to unlock the potential of the elf stones. And it's explained why this is later. Then, like, he, like, pushed himself and was like, come on, come on, and he got them to work. So, he vaporizes the demon. It was so cool. Everyone's just kind of, like, stunned. And then Cephalo turns them in and he's pissed. Because now he knows that the demons were after him. Probably because of the elf stones. The demons can find Will and Amberly if they use the elf stones. Kind of like when Frodo wears the ring you know, Sauron can see him. It's that kind of situation. Cephalo is pissed and he's like, you just put my family in danger, like, I want you to leave, like, take your stupid horse and get out. Will's like, oops. He and Anne really take our tack and just before they leave, Eritrea's like, goodbye Will Olmsford, like, I'm gonna see you again. And Will's like, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, at this point he's already kinda developed a little crush on Eritrea. So now that Will and Amberly have been essentially banished from traveling with the rovers, they're on their own again. They are going through this valley called the Valley of Wren, and they're heading for Arborlon. But once again, the demons track them down, and there's another chase scene, and they're all freaking out. They see this forest ahead, and they're like, hey, like, let's go in there. Maybe the demons can't follow us in there. So they were like, yeah, yeah, and they ride in there, and they do escape the demons, but there's a surprise waiting for them in the forest. Alanon! <laughs> Everyone's favorite druid! They see Alanon and they're like, hey bro, what's up? He's all like, hey. He asks them if they're all right, and Amberly is kind of being a little salty towards him, you know, because she kind of feels like he abandoned them, even though that doesn't really make sense because it wasn't his fault. He was forced to separate from them by the demons. She's kind of being salty towards him, but Will's like cool, you know, he's like chilling. The three of them head off to Arbalon. When they get there, <laughs> The, the king is like, uh-oh, I haven't seen my granddaughter in a long time. Like, I don't know how she's going to react to me. He was still a little bit hurt that she betrayed him and her people and left, but he still loves her, and so does Ander. Arion, on the other hand, does not feel as warmly toward Amberly. He's still mad at her. Aventine gets the council of the elven people, which is six people. It's the king... Ander, Arion, uh, the first minister, the captain of the elven guard or the home guard or something like that, and then it's one other guy, and I can't remember who it is, but yeah, it's the six like most important elves in Arborlon. Alanon pleads 
Amberly's case and is like, look, I know that she made a mistake by leaving, you know, like she shouldn't have done that, but she is our only hope. Like, she's the only one that can do this ritual and rebirth the Elkrees. It takes a little while, but he manages to convince them, and Ander stands up for her first. I'm like, my heart, her uncle still loves her. That's when Arion gets pissed at him and is like, I can't believe you just did that. Like, now you're betraying us too. Arion is like, not talking to Ander now because of that. Mostly everyone else on the council votes that Amberly goes and talks to the tree. So Alanon's like, okay, Gucci. Let's send her in a few days so that she can rest because she's been traveling nonstop for like two or three days. After everyone leaves, it's revealed, uh, psych, you're going tonight. And Amberly's like, wait, what? No, 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 no. Like, I need to prepare. She's like totally panicking and stuff and she starts crying. And Alanon's like, you gotta do it. Like, come on, like, you're gonna be fine. So she's finally like, okay. So the three of them sneak in there. While she's up there talking to the Elkrees, Will and Alanon start talking for a little bit, and Will's like, hey, why did you tell the council that we were going to take Amberly here in, like, two days instead of tonight? And that's when it's revealed that apparently there's a spy in the palace. Will's like, what? Alanon says, yeah, that there's a spy and that that's how the demons kept finding them because the spy was there when Alanon was telling Eventine about Amberly and that they were gonna um, go to Havenstead and all that. That's how the demons were able to find them. So he knows that it's somebody in the palace and close to the king. Now this is where it gets crazy. The changeling. I think he changed himself into the most trusted individual in the entire king's, like, group of people. And it's actually not a person at all. It's Minx, his pet dog! Hear me out! <laughs> it's after she sees the Elkrees. They go back to Eventine's office and they're preparing everything that they need to do to take off at dawn to go to um, a place that I'm going to mention later. Will goes to pet the dog because Manx is just sleeping by the fireplace when he growls at him. Now this isn't normal because Manx is supposedly a very friendly dog, you know, he's usually like really chill, like hey what's good, but he growls at Will, who's a good person and he shouldn't be growling at. So I think the changeling turned himself into Manx because at the beginning of the book, the narrator is saying that the changeling could change himself into anything, even animals. So, I think it's the dog. And I'm like, does that mean the dog's dead? Like, no! Back to when they're in the Garden of Life where the Elkreese is. Alanon tells Will that and he's like, I'm shook. But then Alanon's like, you can't tell Amberly, like, it'll just scare her more. Amberly's kind of a little bit of a crybaby, but it's not her fault. That reminds me. In my first discussion, I think, or my second discussion. I think it was my second discussion. I said that I think Amberly is a child, like, not like a little kid, but like a tween, you know, like 14 years old at the most. She's not. I got that all wrong because I was misled by her description. You know, she's an elf, but they said that she was small even for being an elf. So, you know, I took that as her being like younger. And, you know, they always describe her as having a child's face. I thought she was like, a little a little girl but she's not she's a teenager like a little bit younger than will but not as young as i thought she was and i know this not only because i saw it on the internet but also because they describe her at one point after she's coming out of the garden after talking to the elkries as like her dress like swaying over her breasts or something i don't know i'm not really sure how puberty works with elves but i'm pretty sure that 14 year old girls most of them don't have big enough boobs in order for them to be called proper breasts. So, she's a teenager. My bad. <laughs> that was all my fault. But anyway, now that we've cleared that up, she talks to the Elkrees and the Elkrees accepts her. She didn't turn her away. She accepted her and she gave her the seed. So we're like, alright, cool, we're on a roll. So this is when the three of them go to Eventine's study and they're like, okay, so we're gonna go here. You have to go into this place called the Wild Run, which is kind of like scary and like, nah. but they're gonna send them with, I think, six elven guards. And one of them is Captain Crispin, who was on the elven council. So he could easily be a suspect uh, of like the spy that Alanon knows is in the palace, but I still think it's the dog because he growled at Will. And also later on, it mentions Eventine like walking through the halls and the eyes of someone watching him and it just, it sounds like the dog because there's nobody else there. It can't be Ander. 
There's no way it's Ander. I refuse to believe that because I love Ander with all my heart. And they decide, yeah, we're gonna take off for Draywood, which is a village um, near the Wild Run. They have to stop there first. Will tells Amberly to stay behind, you know, with everyone because they have to go into the woods and make sure that the other guys at the outpost there are like, you know, good to go. They were not good to go. It was a good thing that Amberly stayed behind because once they got there, they found that they were all dead and that there was a demon there. Two of the guys die. Will's just like booking it. He's like, crap! So <laughs> he, he breaks out onto the beach. He's like, abandoned ship. And Amberly's like, what? And then she's like, oh god, no! The boat was sailing away as Will was running trying to catch up to it. But don't worry, he makes it. They escape the Reaper. Everything's Gucci. They keep sailing until they reach the matted breaks. So they're like traveling through this bog and they make it to this like mountain ridge called the Pycon. And there's like a river called the Myrmidon. So you have like the river and you have the mountains and Crispin takes them into the mountains. Like there's this like route that he takes because he knows of an abandoned elven fortress that could provide them like shelter for the night. Not a very good idea because they get there and once again, people get killed. <laughs> Only ones left are Crispin, Amberly, and Will. There's this like catwalk thing and they're kind of running across it, you know, trying to get to the other side. They're like, crap, like we gotta like knock the catwalk down that way he can't come to us. So Crispin and Will are like hitting the pegs with a mallet, you know, trying to get the bridge to collapse. Unfortunately, Crispin dies. He sacrifices himself for Will and Amberly by going out on the bridge and trying to stall the Reaper from getting any further, and Amberly is the one who hits the final peg, causing the catwalk to fall with the Reaper and Crispin. Really sad. Crispin was not the spy. He was loyal to Arbalon and Eventine all along, but it crosses him off. I still think it's the dog! <laughs> Amberly and Will are like really depressed after that because now it's just the two of them. They like get on this little boat and they sail, you know, again. They make it to um, this section of the Pycon called the Rock Spur. They kind of just camp out there for the night. And when they wake up, there's a little elven boy sitting there like looking at him. And Will's like, who are you? And the two of them just kind of talk for a little bit, and it's revealed that his name is Perk. Perk is this sweet little elven boy that is a wing rider. He is training to ride this creature called a rock, which is a type of bird. He, you know, explains that um, this particular group of elves kind of isolated themselves from the rest of the elves because they found this land and they found these birds and they bonded with them. So they call themselves sky elves because they fly. Every other elf is like land elves. That kind of reminds me of Jews and Gentiles, how anyone who isn't a Jew is a Gentile. So that may or may not be an allusion to that, I'm not sure, but that's what came to mind. Perk is like, you know, what are you guys doing? And they explain to him that they're looking for a talisman, but they don't tell him exactly that it's the blood fire. Perk's like, oh, I can help you guys. Like, it'll take way too long if you go through the mountains. Like, let's just fly on my bird. So they hop on the bird and they're like soaring and stuff. They eventually make it to the wild run and they force Perk to like, you know, leave. He's not allowed to go there since he's so young, but he's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm still going to be here for another five days for my training. So if you guys need me, holler with this trusty little whistle and I'll come and take you guys back to Arbalon. So they're like, okay, sweet deal, sweet deal. Meanwhile, at Arbalon, we see Eventine. He is going over like all of the different alliances that he has with the different races because he's setting up his army, preparing for the demon invasion. He talks about Calahorn, which is a uh, territory right near Arbalon, which is of men. Calahorn doesn't have a king. Their last king was Balinor, and after Balinor died, they just kind of lost their way, so they're not really gonna respond. They only send the Free Corps, which is kind of their, like, their last resort. A division of 600 men that basically join the Free Corps to die. 
because they're like the super fighters and most of them die. Like, it's just bound to happen. They were supposed to send the Border Legion, which was like a more um, trustworthy division because there's probably more of them and they're not as likely to die. But Calahorn didn't come through, so now Anders pissed because he's like, we can't just have 600 men against thousands of demons. Like, that's not gonna work. Eventina also talks about the Federation, which is, once again, a group of men in the South um, that formed after the destruction of um, the Warlock Lord, aka the Dagdemor. They are kind of like trying to go after Calahorn because Calahorn hasn't really joined the unification of all the Southland territories. Because that's what the Federation wants to do. It wants to unite everyone in the South. But Calahorn hasn't done that, so they're after them. That's kind of what they're focusing on right now, and they don't really want to get involved in the Elven's um, issues. He's really worried about this, and it's like, you know, it's weighing down on him, but Andrew comes in with all of his, like, all of his research, and <laughs> Evetine is finally starting to get some respect for his second son. Like, all this time, Arion's always been, like, his first favorite, and Anders just kind of been living in his shadow. But now that Anders stepping up to the plate, you know, and really helping Eventine, um, with, like, looking for research and stuff any way that they could defeat the demons, Eventine is learning to appreciate Ander, and it just warms my heart because he, he specifically says, there were times these past few days when he saw more of himself in Ander. So that line just hit me so hard, and then he's like, um, he started wondering suddenly if Ander ever felt the same, and it's like, he loves you so much, like, this is just like with Faramir and Denethor, like, what is happening? Eventine trusts Ander to go out to the Free Corps, you know, and like, tell them, hey, like, what's up, like, these are your rooms or whatever, but then the Free Corps piss him off because they're like, nah, we don't need rooms, we're going out to fight tomorrow, like, we're only gonna stay here the night, we'll just sleep outside. And then the Free Corps tells him that the Border Legion isn't coming, so he's like, are you kidding me? Like, how do they not think that the demons are real? Like, there's more and more of them coming out of the Forbidding every day. Like, what are we gonna do? So the Free Corps are just like, I don't know, man, like, all we can do for you is just fight, you know, and do our best. So Andrew's like, okay, fine, like, that's what we're gonna have to do then. Alanon comes back after being gone for some time. He tells Eventine that he knows where the Forbidding is gonna crumble first. He knows where the demons are gonna attack them first. So now the Elven army can move out there and, you know, be prepared to fight. And this place is called... Okay, I don't know how to pronounce this. The way I, I, it sounds in my head, it doesn't sound like a nice word. These flats is where the demons are going to attack first because that's where the Forbidding is going to crumble first. Alanon's like, yeah... Like, we gotta set out the army there, like, right now. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I will see you guys on Wednesday for my new story time video. I hope you guys have a great night, and I'll see you later. Bye!